Uh, thanks for coming on, Father Webster. Yeah, uh, my, my pleasure. Great. Now, you were actually, in the 1980s, you were actually at the, uh, the seminary up in Rochester for a little while, and uh, Bishop... Uh, Archbishop Tuck actually arrived there exactly when actually maybe first you could you could explain just briefly who was Archbishop um, Tuck well Archbishop Tuck uh, obviously was a was a prince of the church he was an archbishop of the, of the church he was the um, Archbishop of Vietnam and uh, his brother was the president of Vietnam until he was assassinated in uh, 1965 and Archbishop Tuck went to uh, attend Vatican II in, uh, in the early 60s. And, and when his brother was assassinated, Paul VI told him, you better not go back to your country because you may get assassinated also. And so he ended up uh, not having a country to go to, uh, or not having his own country to go to. And he uh, spoke French. The uh, French had actually um, evangelized Vietnam, so he... It was sort of a French Catholic country, even though it was Oriental. But so he felt familiar with the French people and the French language, and he ended up uh, retiring in France and um, settled down there for a while. Um, he was uh, consecrated uh, an archbishop, I believe, in 1939 under Pius XI. And uh, I believe because of the turmoil in this country, he was actually given permission to consecrate bishops uh, on his own free will by Pius XII without any permission from Rome, which is quite extraordinary. And that permission, by the way, was never um, rescinded, even to this day. Sure. That's that's what I had heard, actually. He was given some actual permission, I guess it was by Pius XII, to go ahead and do consecrations when he deemed it uh, necessary to consecrate people. Right. Uh, amazing thing in God's providence. For and, times, I mean. and probably what, uh, I don't know exactly what the percentage would be, but a fair number of priests and bishops derive their orders from Bishop Tuck. That's very true, and uh, thanks be to God. Is it is it probably like 75% maybe? Of the traditional bishops? Of Yeah, of the ones that you know, claim uh, true. Oh, I would say at least. Uh, I Really, they're almost the only line there except for the, for the Lefebvre line that mm -hmm. I recognize or know anything about. Sure. And so he was there, and actually, what what if someone said to you, "Well, I don't think Bishop Tuck was mentally balanced." What things personally did you see that you could say to those people that would refute those kinds of objections? Well, the first thing I would say to that person is, "Did you ever meet him? Did you ever talk to him?" And the answer is always no. And no one that seems to be spreading that uh, that lie, quite frankly, um, has ever met him or talked to him. Mm -hmm. shook his hand or look at him in the eye or anything. So they really don't know. Um, they have no basis to say that other than they heard something from somebody else who had a political reason to be against the Archbishop for some reason. Uh, but no, he was of sound mind. When I went to the uh, community there, he had already been there, I think, probably for almost a year, maybe nine months or so. And uh, he was a regular part of the community, participating in, in the divine office, for example. We used to go to, go to bed at... Uh, about nine o'clock and rise at midnight for matins and he would rise also and participate in matins for an hour or so and uh, then he had mass about five o'clock in the morning uh, every day and I attended that mass every day there's no problems with the mass he also participated in the community meals and uh, was uh, just a part of the community um, I don't think he scourged himself like uh, like they did at times but uh, he was um, basically an active member of the community and um, he actually, I think what happened was uh, when he was there, uh, what, what sort of led up? He, he didn't want to go back to his country. You mentioned this uh, earlier. And so he had to find somewhere to go, and so that's how he got in contact with Bishop Louis Vesselis? Or exactly? Oh, no, no. What happened is, um, well, I don't know if you want me to go over the history of the, the first consecrations in 81, but... Uh, I'll skip that unless you want me to talk about that. Well, yeah, maybe maybe you could inform some of the people that don't know. He did he did some major consecrations of what two bishops in 1981 uh, in, actually, in Mexico. Well, between 81 and 82, there was at least three. Uh, one where there were two Mexican bishops, elderly men. Uh, actually, what happened? I might, let me explain this also. It might be interesting to your listeners. Yeah. Uh, at the time, Archbishop Tuck was basically in retirement. Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, who was the most prominent 
traditional bishop in the world. There's really only three that we knew of, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, Archbishop Tuck, and Bishop Castro de Meyer Bishop, in, in, our, in South America. Bishop Castro de Meyer would only take care of his own diocese, and Archbishop Tuck was on public record saying he would never, ever consecrate a bishop. Remember, this is about 1981. And Archbishop uh, Tuck was uh, just re- was retired, basically, in, in an exile. So two German uh, businessmen went to the Archbishop and they begged him, look, you've got to do something to save the priesthood. This is the situation, as I, as I just described it briefly. And so they persuaded him to uh, consecrate uh, a bishop or two. And so then the next question is, well, who do you consecrate in these times? So he really did, I think, pick the best he could at that time. He picked two very distinguished um, elderly uh, Mexican priests to consecrate. Um, and uh, one of them was head of a large uh, traditional organization called Trento and from Mexico, Bishop Carmona. And then he picked uh, perhaps the greatest uh, theologian in the world alive at that time, which was Bishop Deloria, who was a French uh, Dominican, an elderly man who had uh, been at Vatican II also. I think he was a theologian for um, Cardinal Atiyavani uh, at the council. So anyway, they persuaded him to do this, and he consecrated these three men. And that's basically, uh, as I understand it, the last thing he really did of, of great significance, uh, other than suffer a lot. Uh, but uh, these men then upon consecrated some others, and that is what began the tuck line. Well, um, about this time, now it's, uh, I think it's uh, 1983, I think it's the winter of 1983, and Bishop Azalis had become a, a tuck bishop from uh, one step, well, actually from the Mexicans. I think it was uh, Bishop Carmona was one of the three bishops who consecrated him with um, the American Bishop Musi uh, from the tuck line also. He was from Texas. He was from Texas here, Fort okay. Worth, Texas. And he was a good friend of the Mexican bishops uh, before their consecration, and so they consecrated him as the first American. I believe Bishop Musi was the first American tuck bishop. It was about 1982 or three. And then, um, well, what happened is this. The, the, the American priest, uh, there was a, a bunch of American traditional priests who were really suffering, not having a bishop to work with. They didn't know uh, before this happened. Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre would not work with them. He only would work with his own organization, the Pius Defense Society. And so the, the American priests uh, were, wanted to have a bishop. You know, they need bishop for confirmation, bishop for holy oils, and, and things like that. And to, uh, you know, ordain other priests for this country and things. So um, they had a meeting, actually, in uh, Connecticut um, about the time uh, Bishop Musi was consecrated. They didn't know he had been consecrated. And they having a meeting to decide... Uh, whom amongst them should they select to approach Archbishop uh, Tuck to decide if, if he would consecrate him, consecrate one of them, you know. And then at the meeting they discovered about Bishop Musi. So then they ended up going to Bishop Musi. I'm making a long story short here. But to make a long story short, he ended up consecrating um, Bishop Vizalis or, uh, from uh, Rochester. He was one of the priests. Well, then after that, they thought it would be nice. I'm not sure how they came about exactly, but the, 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 the word was it would be nice to have Archbishop Lefebvre come to this country and, and meet the American priest and the new bishops and, and take a little break. That was the ostensible uh, reason, I suppose. And um, at least that's the reason I was given. And so uh, Bishop Azalus went there uh, to France and um, escorted the Archbishop back to his uh, priory in Rochester, New York, uh, for a short visit, and uh, and he was in t- planning, uh, intending to go back to France, where he was a, a close friend of this uh, Bishop Deloria, who he'd, con- who he'd consecrated. And well, so he at, c- he goes to Rochester. What year, roughly, was that? This was, I believe, the winter of '83. Okay, if I got that right. Yeah. Um, now he died December of '84, so I think that's the right time frame. Uh huh. Um, so, uh, anyway, I don't know, but I, should I continue? Yeah, yeah, question? no, no, continue. So where was I? <laughs> you were talking about oh. how he was going to go back to France. Oh, yeah, Bishop Delore was expecting him to return uh, to France. I verified that directly in, in, at some later time and called him, and he said he was expecting the Archbishop to return. Where was he? It had been so long now. It had been almost a year by that time. So, anyway, he was in um, Rochester, and... I didn't really know too much about that. I don't think anyone else did either. Uh, I ended up going there as a seminarian 
uh, in the end of 83. As I say, he'd been there probably nine months or so. And um, I befriended, of course, the superior, who was Bishop Bazalus. We got along, I think, quite well, and um, I thought he was a pretty good superior in many ways. But then he started to reveal to me some, some <laughs> let us call them dirty tricks or whatever that he was doing, and I, I was kind of taken aback by them. Uh, but I, well, what, I, what, what were some of those things? Well, he, he told me that the Archbishop did indeed want to go back to France, but he was being prevented from doing so because uh, his passport was uh, was uh, taken, actually stolen from him out of his room, I, so I understood it. And then when uh, the Archbishop applied to the French Embassy uh, in, New York, in New York City for another one, another passport, uh, then uh, that was intercepted when it was mailed to the Priory. Bishop was always intercepted the mail. And the Archbishop didn't know that, of course, and so he's there, and it was, at that time it was six months he'd been waiting uh, for this new passport. So he could get out of there. Yeah, to so go back home to France. And and so Bishop Vesselis, he actually told you, uh, he he actually stated to you that he actually took his passport. Yeah, he told me that. He this told you not, that explicitly. Yeah, this is not secondhand information. This, okay. He told me this directly. So. Now, now, what what he said that he took Bishop uh, Tuck's passport, and what was his reasoning as to why he said that was permissible for him to do that? So he couldn't leave. <laughs> so he couldn't leave. That was the reason. Uh, very clear. The reason he told me this, uh, I learned later, was so because he wanted me, he had a lot of dirty tricks up his sleeve, and he wanted me to go along with them. And this was sort of the icebreaker. You know, if I'd go along with this one, then uh, he could probably, well, not probably, he would. He could reveal more things to me and, and see, I suppose, how mm. much I could take. And um, So so he, he told you, just going back to this, he explicitly tells you that he took Bishop Tuck's passport, so he took it out of his room, Right. I mean yeah, that's, that's right. okay. Yeah, and that then, was almost about like a take. Anyway, go ahead. I'm did sorry. did he also explicitly state that he intercepted it through the mail, or that was just basically yeah, assumed? Yeah, I, I would have no way of knowing that otherwise. Oh, so he also told you that he that he intercepted the mail passport the, when he tried to refile and get a new copy. Yeah, he got the new copy exactly. He intercepted and so, but it. I, he, and he so, told me that. Yeah, and he told you that also. That's the only way I would know. Yeah. Wow, so he told you that not only did he take the passport from him, he took also the passport that was coming, the, the uh, replacement Repl one. Yeah, exactly. Wow, he that's, took, took them both, right. That's really something. I think you were saying that actually when you initially arrived there with your vehicle, uh, he basically just told you to park the car in and, and the back and, and, well, and, and uh, let the fluid out. What was the story behind that? <laughs> well, the car was from, <laughs> had been in Florida, and it wasn't winterized for Rochester, a much colder place. And when it came, I asked for permission to go down to the street to the gas station to have some antifreeze put in it, and he denied me the permission. Instead, he recommended that I take the car behind the garage and and uh, drain all the fluid out of it, and just you know, like in other words, don't use it. I said, and he said to me, "You're not going anywhere, are you?" And I said, "Well, no, I wasn't going anywhere, but I didn't want the car to block the brake uh, to freeze up." So. So uh, this I, this way you couldn't even leave though. No, and that, so then he had two prisoners. <laughs> he would have two prisoners. See, I didn't realize. I didn't realize at the time everybody was a prisoner there in, a, in, in some way, some form, really. So, in your opinion, obviously Bishop Tuck was actually, even though he may not have wanted to come out and cause a, a ruckus there, he was really a, a prisoner. He was a prisoner. Yeah. Absolutely, indeed, he was a prisoner. So, what did Bishop Tuck communicate to anyone else when the second passport? When he tried to get that through the mail after his first one was taken, did he communicate to anyone in the monastery that, say, spoke French that uh, he felt like this is really bad and dirty and wants to leave here? No, and... he didn't know it was taken. Okay. No, they didn't tell him. He thought that was they hadn't sent it yet. Okay. What about the first one that was in his room that was taken? Well, he just thought he lost it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then maybe thought that they never maybe sent the second one. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, they fooled him. So, um, now Bishop Vesselis, one of the other things I think you were telling me is that, and I actually someone else told me this, but I thought that, that Bishop Vesselis was actually uh, not, not really being serious, that uh, he was speaking facetiously. So, someone told me that he hypnotizes people, and I just brushed it off. I had heard this years ago. And um, that he wasn't serious, uh, that this person heard this from Bishop Vesselis, and not that he actually hypnotizes people, but you actually told me that he not only hypnotized people there, but he tried to get you 
to be hypnotized. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, he, I, I understood he hypnotized all of the locations that were there. Um, and he was... Um, and he did. He tried to sell me on the idea of being hypnotized, appealing to my pride by telling me that you have to be intellectual. So therefore, I can, if I consider myself intellectual, then I certainly want to prove that and become hypnotized. And also, it's a lot of fun to be hypnotized. And so he explicitly told you that hypnotism can be fun? Yeah, he said it was fun. It's a lot of fun, and you have to be intellectual, otherwise you can't go under the, you know, when you're hypnotized. So. And of course, we want to go under, don't we? You know, so it, was, it was an appeal to, uh, you know, that was the appeal to do it. Do you know exactly how he hypnotized people, or, or just that he did do it? I don't know. I know he did it. I, yeah. I know one technique, part of the technique, was that he had this strange-looking spiral shape, black and white spiral of, of, un, uh, of uh, increasing uh, diameter circles, a spiral type of arrangement. And, and it was disorienting just to look at it. And he would have you look at that, and then he did something else to you or something else, said something else to you, and that's how you went under. But I only know that was the beginning phase of it was the strange thing he had. It was about two and a half feet square over his desk in his, in his room, and uh, that was what that was for. But that's as far as I got to, uh, to become hypnotized myself. And so at that point, you were just like, i got to get, get out of here. Well, I, was, I had one foot out the door at that time, and, and that was putting the other half of the foot out, the other, half of the other foot out the door. Um, uh, finally, when, you want, what do you, you want me to continue? Where yeah, yeah, I sure, or, sure. Or, uh, I'm so, I'm, yeah, you can continue, uh, yeah, where okay. you're going. Yeah. Or I can tell you why he, that he hypnotized everybody else. So, so, but the other other seminarians actually also told you that they were hypnotized or were going to be. A couple of them uh, indicated that, yes. And I, I, it's been a long time, over twenty years, but I understood they had all been hypnotized. They'd all gone there as secular vocations. Now, one of them went there with a Franciscan vocation in mind, and uh, then within, a, I think, less than a year, all but one of them, ten out of, ten out of eleven, were wearing the Franciscan habit. So, so, but they had been hypnotized before they had made that decision. And with the and he, but he explicitly said, "quote Hypnotism can be fun." That's that's what. You, oh, absolutely! He didn't yeah. say it can be fun. He said it is fun. Oh, it is fun. Okay. Yeah, I never forgot that. Yeah. Wow. And so, now this this led up. Now, now what happened? Maybe you want to continue the story that leads up to the kidnapping of Bishop Tuck. Um, what what happened? Sort of next. Uh, well, okay, the Archbishop um, <coughs> needed some help. I, you know, you, you can only guess what was in his mind. But he didn't want to be there, and he wanted to go back. So, And he had a, he was a foreigner and didn't speak the language. He did speak French. And uh, so what does he do to get out of there? Well, uh, I, I, he must have thought, well, I'll have to contact somebody who speaks Vietnamese. He did that. He uh, had a pay phone in the, in the hallway. And he contacted someone who spoke Vietnamese. And um, I overheard the conversation, didn't know, understand a word, but I knew he was speaking Vietnamese, Vietnamese to somebody. Well, not too long after that, a uh, Vietnamese priest came to visit him and see him. And we assumed he was from the diocese, but we never knew really who he was. And then he visited. They had a conversation in, in uh, Vietnamese, of course. No one understood what that was about. Um, but I, I would presume now that it was his initial contact with the outside world, and he probably told them his dilemma about, uh, you know, not wanting to be there. And uh, so not too long after that, within a week or two, this um, very wealthy, uh, I mean, probably super wealthy Vietnamese businessman came there with, with a stretch limousine and a chauffeur and some other assistants in the, in the back. And um, he owned a couple of hotels, one in New York City and one in Rochester, New York. And... Um, and he came by, he had called first before he came by. I, I wasn't privy to that conversation, uh, but apparently he befriended uh, Arch, uh, a Bishop Azalis a little bit and um, brought some Vietnamese food for the bishop because he didn't like the, the food in the priory there, which was horrible by anybody's uh, standards. And he didn't have any, of course, Oriental food there. Anyway, he brought a big case of food, and uh, he talked to the Archbishop, and then he talked to Bishop Azalis, and... Anyway, make a long story short, it was um, requested of Archbishop Azalez to let them have custody of uh, Archbishop Tuck uh, for a couple of days for a weekend and celebrate a, a Vietnamese New Year uh, in New York City. 
and uh, sort of with the promise or the hint that uh, maybe a big donation was coming forward from this you know, multimillionaire. And that's that's what you're saying that, in your opinion, you thought the only reason that Bishop Vassalis allowed him to be sort of uh, taken in the care of these people is that he was hoping for a large donation from this uh, rich Vietnamese businessman? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, okay. And, um, but the, the, the Bishop of was suspicious and not completely trusting, and um, so he had one of the, uh, the Franciscan brothers, uh, Brother Francis, go, go with him to New York City. He insisted that he be accompanied by him. Uh, this uh, bishop, uh, this uh, brother, I mean, spoke uh, French, and uh, he's a young man, probably early 20s. And um, the bishop, actually, Bishop Zales requested that they, anyway, there's a lot of details, but they ended up taking him to New York City, and where they, Brother Francis, the Archbishop, the Archbishop stayed in a hotel uh, near 42nd Street in New York City. Now, now just, just briefly going back, when they picked him up, I think you said that these guys looked somewhat nervous or were sweating, or someone made that statement, I think. The millionaire looked very nervous to me. Really? He was, uh, walking around, shaking, his hands were shaking a lot. Really? Like they were up to some kind of a crime, you know? Wow. And when the Archbishop left, I said to myself, I'm, we're never going to see him again. You know? Well, I'd, I'd saw him again, but not, I never saw him in Rochester again. That was the last time he was ever in Rochester. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And so you were saying then they get they went to New York City? They went to New York City, and um, instead of bringing him back after the weekend, uh, he called the, this uh, millionaire, I think it was Chong or something like that, he called the uh, Bishop of Zalis and asked if he could stay longer and also asked if um, he could have some of the bishop's um, formal attire, you know, his petrol cross and his, uh, you know, dress cassock and things like that. And um, uh, on the essential reason, he wanted to visit some relatives or something. Uh, so again, amazingly, the uh, Bishop of Zales went along with it and said, okay, and sent him things. He didn't have a petrol cross there for some reason, but they bought him one in New York City for over $400 and um, dressed him up. But the reason was not to see relatives. The reason was to see the apostolic delegate, uh, P.O. Loggi, in, in Washington, D.C., but we didn't know that at the time. Um, and do you think that Bishop Bishop was Bishop Tuck going along with meeting this uh, heretical? Uh... Well, we're not sure if, if he knew where he was going. They took uh, him okay. off in the limousine. They were always taking him off in limousine to go somewhere. You see, to nice restaurants or something, you know, maybe sightseeing. And so, who knows if he knew where he was going that day? Uh -huh. I, I understand Brother Francis did not know where they were going, um, but um, whatever reason they gave, they took him off in the car. Now, um, it's possible the Archbishop knew. Um, I mean, who knows? He he might have been trying to use them to get back to France. That was my guess. Oh, that they would they would set up something so he could fly back there. Yeah, and help him get back there or something. And you know, who knows? They might. Um, you know, all they wanted him to do was to cease and desist, you know, and not be a traditionalist anymore. And they actually wanted him to recant what he had done to renounce the uh, his bishop that he consecrated to, to discredit all of us, you know. But anyway, he ended up driving down to in his limousine to Washington D.C. with Brother Francis, and uh, then there was a Brother Francis. I, I believe thought it was a surprise because uh, he said that they took him, him and the Archbishop, up to meet Theologi, and lo and behold, um, the way they engineered it, that somehow they separated the Archbishop and Brother Francis by just a few yards or something, and then they closed the door and locked it at a room, and he couldn't get back in the room. So and this this brother Francis couldn't get back in the room. No, he couldn't go back in the room where the archbishop was, and so he called up the, um, the priory and, and, and Rochester and told us this. You know, we're Bishop Azalez was really upset about that, and uh, he asked the brother Francis to call him back as soon as anything else happens. You know, well, um, the uh, the details are kind of way far in my memory, but. They did end up having dinner together with Brother Francis and the Archbishop, a somewhat amiable uh, dinner. And uh, Brother Francis did indeed call the Bishop Zealous, and he put uh, Archbishop Tuck on the phone, uh, who spoke to Bishop Zealous. And uh, Bishop Zealous asked him what transpired, and Bishop Tuck said that they asked me to recant my consecrations, and uh, that would undo everything I've done, and I'm not going to do that. 
And when I asked again if he signed anything, he said, no, I didn't sign anything. And I won't. I just, the Bishop, Archbishop Tuck said, I just stalled them a little bit. I just stalled them, you know. Well, then the Archbishop... Um, and this is what, P.O. Loggi that's trying to get him to sign something? Yeah, P.O. Yeah. Loggi, directly. No, just as a side point here, and I think remember to the listeners that uh, uh, this is the, the supposedly this man is gaga um, senile and doesn't know what he's doing, and yet the the apostolic delegate is negotiating with him, and people are taking him places and, and talking to him, and nobody's even making any notice. Or he's filing for new passports over the phone. Yeah, and contacting people. This is a man that has his, has his wits about him. Let me tell you. And then this is this is several years after the the consecrations he did in Mexico, which uh, Bishop uh, Clarence Kelly tries to say he wasn't mentally balanced. We have to presume his orders are invalid because he was not mentally balanced. He was senile, and uh, of and this is in eighty three or eighty four. He's going about and doing all these things. Yeah, I, I think the first round he was eighty one when he consecrated yeah. one of them. And this is, as I say, 84, and so that's yeah. three years later, and usually if you have dementia, it, it degenerates and gets worse with time, not better. So sure. he would have been in a better condition in 81 if he had any condition in 84. And I think one of the other things he tried to say is, well, we only have a couple of witnesses to certain consecrations, but uh, as other people have pointed out, there have been many consecrations of bishops with no witnesses that the church is regarded as valid, obviously. Yeah, absolutely, that's true. Particularly in persecuted countries like communist yeah. countries, there have been uh, under, uh, you know secret consecrations done, one on one. So, um, but his consecrations were not in secret. There was a, a witness or two there, and uh, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, some priests went to Bishop Castro de Meyer a few years later uh, to ask him if he thought that the Tuck consecrations were valid. This is after Tuck had died. And uh, he uh, was told who Tuck had consecrated, these two Mexicans, um, and Bishop Delorier. And he says, well, Delorier, if anybody would know it's valid, it's Delorier. He's the greatest theologian there is in the world, and, and if he says it's valid, it's valid. I would take his opinion over my opinion in this particular matter, you know, or any matter, really. So so that was the response, the respect that, I should say, that um, uh, Bishop Castro Namara had for this uh, Bishop Delorier. Uh, I could be wrong in this, but Bishop Kelly, actually, the Society of Pius V, they won't even give the sacraments to anyone who goes to a priest that derives, uh, has their orders from a tuck line bishop. Is that correct? That's correct. As a matter of fact, if, if you go to a tuck, uh, the, the mass of a tuck priest, they will not give you Holy Communion. Wow. Wow, that's just amazing. Now, didn't also Brother Francis was mentioning that uh, they actually poisoned maybe possibly the food. Can you tell us some more about that? Yeah, well, getting back to the dinner that they had in Washington, after the meeting with Pio Loggi, uh, Bishop Zealous had told Brother Francis to take a taxi to the airport that very night and come back to uh, Rochester, New York. Didn't matter what the plane ticket cost, just get back as soon as possible. So they went back to the room, the hotel room that they had, and packed up their, uh, began to pack their bags, and as they packed up, they were packing their bags, they both collapsed. Uh, uh, Brother Francis and Archbishop Tuck but collapsed right there. They didn't even get into bed. They were just collapsed right there on the floor where they were sitting there working on their luggage and slept like a, you know, a rock. So it's, it's not like they just they laid down in the bed and they fell asleep. They actually were unpacking stuff or packing stuff, and they just absolutely collapsed. Absolutely collapsed. No, they had no intention of sleeping. They were going to the airport. Yeah. So, wow! Uh, no, they believed they were they were, they were drugged, and, and um, maybe the, f- the food, obviously, yeah. No, well, however they did it, you know, I think it's pretty easy to do actually if you want to do it. <laughs> wow! So um, anyway, then the next morning they ended up with the same crowd, and they ended up driving back to New York in the limousine. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but I think it was described as as they were sort of they sort of needed them for the for the temporal needs at the time. Uh, Brother Francis, you know, was a Franciscan friar with under vows of poverty, and that was, um, the rule kept pretty well. He didn't have a dime on him. And he had, when he had to make a phone call, he had to beg the quarter to make the phone call. So they sort of needed the, uh, these uh, rich uh, businessmen to feed them and everything and, and um, help them with these little things. And so uh, whatever transpired in the morning, they ended up going back in the limousine with the promise they're going to go to Rochester from there. Okay, go back to this hotel in New York City, then to Rochester. 
So they did that. They drove well. They drove back to New York City, but they never came back to Rochester. Um, you want me to continue with the narrative? With what sure. happened next? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, at some point, then um, Bishop Bazell was was really getting upset, and uh, he talked to the businessman over the phone after they were all back in New York City, and he promised this and that he's going to bring them back. And finally, the, the Bishop Bazell says, "I've had enough of this," and he said to me, "I happen to be standing next to him when he was on the phone at this particular conversation." And he said, I'm going to New York City right now. I said, you're kidding. What's going on, you know? He says, well, take a ride with me to the airport, and and, um, and I'll tell you all about it. So I did. One of the brothers drove us to the airport. I was only going there to, to hear the story. Because we, we were very friendly, actually. And so um, he um, we got to the airport, and he says, why don't you come with me to the airport? He said, you used to live in New York City, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. He says, well, you know your way around there. You can help me out. I said, okay. So I went there in New York City with him that day without even, <laughs> with nothing, you know, no change of clothes, no toothbrush, nothing. And uh, anyway, we got there in the afternoon, heading to the airport, LaGuardia, heading towards the hotel in New York City uh, in Times Square. And we got there uh, probably about between 3 and 4 o'clock. We went right to the lobby and uh, walked uh, straight to the elevator. And this is an old building, and it didn't have automatic elevators. It had an elevator operator. So as we're Walking to the elevator, we, we had to pass the front desk, and at the front desk was this uh, Vietnamese businessman, very wealthy, and he um, saw us and ran across the room, very friendly, and he smiled, shaking hands and everything. Like, oh, how nice to see you here, you know. <laughs> Talk about hypocrisy. But anyway, um, so he went up to the room with us, up to the suite on the top floor, the 24th floor. It was kind of a decrepit suite, but it was a suite. It was, a, it was actually a welfare hotel. Uh, where uh, people who uh, were in welfare lived at the uh, uh, with housing paid for by the government, and he so he had all this money coming in from the federal government uh, to support all these people. So it wasn't that great of a hotel, even though it was a suite. It had a couple of bedrooms in it and a living room in it. We went there into the room, and uh, Brother Francis was there uh, with the uh, Archbishop, and our plan was to um, okay back up and go. The Archbishop was very sleepy. Um, they had been. He had a little touch of diabetes, and uh, he. They were pumping him with sugar. Brother Francis told me, and any time they could get a drink in him, they put a drink in him, and it was. Uh, he was way off balance there, and he was making him very tired, so he was sleeping a lot, and very groggy. You know, they didn't want him apparently to have his oldest witch with him, uh, in that regard. So, anyway, uh, when and they, they woke him up, and then, out of nowhere came into the room about uh, t uh, at least two, maybe three Vietnamese bishops, elderly men, all over 60 or 70, and, uh, I don't know, three or four Vietnamese priests. It was amazing. They had all somehow come there. I guess they, uh, I, I don't know where they came from, but they came there to this hotel room. And so um, they all spoke French, and so Bishop Bazelis uh, spoke to them in French, um, sort of a cordial conversation, amazingly. And waiting for the bishop to get dressed, Archbishop Tuck to get dressed and everything and ready so we can take him back. Well, when he was finally dressed um, and stood up and, and uh, Bishop Zale started to help him to put on his um, and cassock and everything, the um, uh, one of the bishops came in there and pushed the Archbishop Tuck right down on the bed. I couldn't believe it. And wow, so you saw one of the bishops actually push him down on the bed? Yeah, exactly. Push him right down violently on the bed. I couldn't believe my eyes. You know? Wow. And I said to myself, what, what am I going to do? I can't hit this man. <laughs> he was only, you know, waist high. And he was an elderly man. He was a cleric. He was a bishop. I couldn't. Well, well I mean, if he was, if he, he were assaulting a bishop, you could, you could, you know, restrain him or, or hit him. Well, I did restrain yeah. him. I grabbed his hands and I held him, uh -huh. I pinned him on the bed, which is very easy to do. He was very weak. And I did that as Archbishop, um, uh, uh, Bishop Tuck, I mean, it led the Archbishop towards the door. Um, Brother Francis, oh, well, this, I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit. Brother Francis had left the room previously to go and call the police because they wouldn't uh, put us, uh, he couldn't use the phone in the hotel room because the switchboard wouldn't connect him to the police station. <laughs> and at some point, the, uh, the, uh, uh, only the bishop was there, this one Vietnamese bishop at this point in time, and one priest was there. And the others had all left for some reason at the, during this time. We were there an hour or so at least before this happened. 
So anyway, we're walking the Archbishop Tuck towards the uh, uh, door of the suite to, to go to the elevator, and we uh, uh, go through there. This other priest tried to intervene. I had to pin him behind the door, actually. It was kind of, <laughs> this is a saga for a movie, let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, So Bishop Azalis and Archbishop Tuck walked out to the hallway and, and, and pushed the button for the elevator, and um, I went out to the hall, and as the elevator opened, it was full of people. It was just amazing how many people were in the elevator. And it was full of uh, several Oriental laymen, a couple of Oriental women, um, six policemen, uh, Brother Francis. Uh, it was a circus. It was, like again, another scene from a movie. So and we're just going back to this. Another priest, you had to, you had to pin his hand. Uh, what, what was he doing? Well, there's he was trying to pull the archbishop away from the door. So I, and I had to restrain him from doing so it's, that. So it's obvious that they're trying to Hold imp- there imprison this guy, yeah. They're holding it against his will, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, and also all the, the the bishops and the other priests were on the elevator too. It was incredible how many people were on this elevator. Well, the well, hallway's full of people, and the police um, wanted to see what was going on. So that's a typical police action. Well, they had to hear the story from everybody, and they had to separate everybody so nobody could hear anybody else's story. You know, and tell a false story or something. Sure. So that took a long time. There was a lot of people there. And it's going on, you know, pretty late at night now. Um, eight or nine o'clock. Um, bear in mind, we got there about 3.30 or 4, right? So um, the police bring us all back into this uh, hotel room. And um, the big question finally came down to where does the Archbishop want to be? Does he want to be with the with the uh, Anglos in, in Rochester or with his own kind of Vietnamese people uh, somewhere else in New York City there. And the, so they couldn't ask for um, one of the group there to interpret for him, for the police. The police didn't speak any French. Mm-hmm. So they had to find an inter- a translator for the police. Well, the, as I found out later, the protocol is for the police department. They, they have professional translators that they use when they want to um, deal with diplomats. And they didn't use that. And they, instead, they called a French restaurant and got a, a waitress, a little girl who spoke French, which is a joke. Never should have done that way. And they had the this girl ask the bishop, Archbishop, talk over the telephone, um, where he wanted to be that night. Now, who knows what the archbishop thought? Um, he he was exhausted. He was tired, and certainly he didn't want to travel that night. And so he said, "I want to be here," you know. And, <laughs> And go to bed where I was a few minutes, an hour or two ago, you know. And uh, anyway, so it was confusing, and we're not even sure he actually, what actually the lady asked him on the telephone, but uh, that's where the police took it. And um, so he ended up staying there that night, and we convinced the police that he had to have Brother Francis there, who was, in a sense, his nurse. And then the other side, the Vietnamese side, put um, a Vietnamese layman there who they claimed was nephew, you know, probably a bunch of baloney, but that's what they said. So anyway, those three are staying in the hotel room all night. Um, we went to stay um, at uh, actually my family's, one of my family's, uh, my brother's places, not too far away in Long Island. In the morning, Brother Francis frantically called us, again, he had to go out and beg the money for the phone call, and uh, from across the street of the hotel, and he'd said that about uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, Archbishop Tuck woke up. Actually, he got up before that. I'm sorry, maybe six o'clock or something. He got up. He offered mass, and now we wanted to go back to Rochester. Kind of logical, right? We get a good night's sleep, play mass, go back home. And um, when that was discovered by the other Vietnamese man in the um, in the in the suite there, well, actually, he, that's when Brother French was locked out of the room, and he had to go again across the street to make the phone call. Well, when Brother Francis went back to see the Archbishop, they wouldn't let him back in the room. So, uh, now, th- this is the guy that's claiming to be his nephew? Yeah, well, of course. Okay. Was, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, which, what, of course, wasn't, probably. Probably not. Uh, yeah. But he locked him out of the room, and so it was just uh, Bishop Tuck and this guy who's claiming to be Bishop Tuck's nephew. That... Well, we don't know who was in the room at that time okay. because Brother Francis had to go across the street, and certainly he must have contacted mm-hmm. the, the millionaire businessman who owned the hotel. And okay. How many people were in the room then, you know? But before he went off to make the phone call across the street. Just the one man, yeah. There was just this guy is claiming to be his nephew in the room. Right, and he okay. locked it, yeah. And, uh, so uh, he told the people that... Uh, was he uh, actually sleeping in the room somewhere in another bed? He slept, uh, I, I think he slept on the couch in the suite. Okay. Yeah. 
and the brother Francis had his room. And so he's sort room. of on the same floor in the same room, big room. Okay. No, it was in, it was in the suite. The suite had a had a had a, had a living room in it. Okay. And two bedrooms. Okay. So, uh, so then we don't know who was in the room, and we never talked to us Bishop Tuck again. Um, we uh, Bishop Zales and I went back to the hotel. Obviously, we couldn't get in anywhere. We ended up going with Brother Francis to the police to try to get uh, you know them to demand to see him again after they'd seen him last night the night before. Well, by the time we got all this done, it was the evening shift that come on to the police at the police station, and it was the same guys who had been there the night before. And I said, "What are you guys still trying to get him back?" You know, we, we already we already settled this case, and they were kind of uh, indignant. Anyway. Um, an awful lot of little details, so I don't think you want to hear them all. But uh, it, what the, the, the bottom line was that we decided that we could probably, we could get an attorney and prove that the Archbishop was in our custody in Rochester by having mail that we had there. Also, Bishop Hills had a power of attorney for, for his activities in this country signed by the Archbishop. And um, so it was easy to prove that he had been with us in, in our possession and uh, we should be able to see him again and, and verify that and have him come back with us. That was the plan. Well, uh, somehow, as we were going about getting an attorney and everything, Bishop Azale has changed his mind, and he somehow thought this thing through, and he decided that, um, he's really how he put it to me. He says, you know, this isn't such a bad thing. Uh, this is an old man. He's going to get sicker, and we're going to take care of him, which which tells you that he never planned to let him go back to France. We would have to take, take care of him. And uh, if if they take care of him, we don't have to take care of him. And if they take care of him, then he'll never consecrate a, a rival to me, since I, you know, as, as another bishop. He didn't want any more bishops consecrated in the whole world, because he wanted to be the only one. So Wow, so you actually heard him make those kinds of statements. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and so this is... Uh, that's just amazingly selfish and, and evil. <laughs> Unbelievable! Wow. So he he's saying that he's worried that <clears throat> he says that uh, well we might as well let the Novus Ordo Church have him because he's old. They can take care of him. They can they can keep handle him. him. And uh, if he's in the Novus Ordo or at least with them, he's not going to go around and consecrate any more so-called traditional bishops that will be rivals, as you were saying, of him, exactly. Bishop Celis. Exactly. That's that's uh, wow. So I was, just, you know, I, I almost fell off the chair. And um, now, so when you, you maybe you mentioned this as far as like the room that he was in that he was locked out of and he couldn't get back in. He called up and he said he couldn't get back in the room, Brother Francis. Did they they eventually try to get back in that room with the police, or at that time they were gone? At that point in time, March, uh, Bishop. Tom? Well, here's what happened in, yeah. in, in, in detail. Here, we met Brother Francis. Um, I guess it was in the lobby. Of the, no, no, we went to the police station when Brother French was locked out of the room after the Mass, you know. And um, uh, we had two police with us, I believe, and Brother Francis, Bishop Zales, myself. And um, Brother Joseph came down with papers to prove that he he'd actually flown a plane that day, Brother Joseph, and come down with papers proving that we had been with our bishop, the bishop, bishop Tucker lived with us. And we were all going up to the room together with the police, and as I said, it was a, a manual manually operated elevator, the elevator operator would not uh, take us upstairs, even with the police. Really? Yeah, and so then we uh, were on the elevator, and one cop was called to the desk to talk on the phone, and he was talking to Mr. Chong upstairs in the suite, and um, the other one was in the elevator with us, and then after about 10 minutes on the phone, the other officer came back and said, okay, you men get off the elevator, and then he and the other officer went upstairs to talk to the Archbishop. Well, we knew at that point that we were never going to see the Archbishop again because we knew that the man was too clever upstairs and they were going to just fool the police. And sure enough, the police came down and said, well, he wants to be here, that's the end of that. <laughs> wow. And that's when we decided to They, get they didn't the, ask to say, can we talk to Bishop Tuck? Or well, the plan just... was to have both sides talk to him again in the daytime when he was alert and wide awake, you know. Uh-huh. And um, Bishop, uh, this, uh, Mr. Chung, the millionaire, Wanted that idea. Who knows what he told the police? Wow. And hey, so he, at he that might have bribed the police. Who knows what he did? He might have given thousands of dollars. Who knows what he did? And so at that point, you basically had to give up, and that was the last you saw of Bishop Tuck. Well, the only other course was legal recourse with an attorney 
to try and get his get him back. And that's when the bishop uh, Bishop Azalez decided not to pursue it anymore. And instead, I found myself in a taxi cab with the with the three Franciscans. I was not in the Franciscan habit; I was in a, a Catholic. But we were all going back to the LaGuardia Airport, going back to Rochester, and, and Bishop uh, Bazell was explaining to me what I just said, that he wants to, um, it's better that he stays where he is, we don't have anything to do with him anymore. And, <laughs> you know, my stomach was so, turning, you know. Wow. And that, that was on the uh, on the flight back or on the... It was on the in the taxi cab on the way to the airport. That's where it, he made those statements. Yeah, and then in the airport, I remember the airplane too now, I happen to be sitting right in front of the Bishop Bazell, and he was repeating these things over and over, you know, and we should all go along with this thing. And then the brothers uh, finally realized that, you know, they, they knew they'd been with the bishop, with the Bazell for a couple of years. They knew that you have to go along with him. Uh, and so they changed their viewpoints. Uh, they don't, I, don't, I don't think they agreed with the bishop in the first place, but then after they realized that was a party line and a politically right thing to uh, hold, they went along with him and they all tried to talk me into going along with it. Well, I didn't want to say too much contrary to them because I was still living there and didn't want to be out in the street that night myself. So I just sort of nodded and and and, and uh, bit my tongue. Uh, but um, in my heart, what? I said, I'm, yeah. I'm out of here. Well, I mean, at that point, someone would have to say that you know that's wrong. You know, uh, at that point, because I mean, that's clearly evil to have him to have someone saying that he should stay in the Novus Ordo Church, and so he doesn't consecrate people and. You know, I mean, someone would have to say something at that point. I was going to ask you, though, this <clears throat> this power of attorney that he had, was that willingly given to Bishop? I wonder how that was. That was probably his, by subterfuge also. He didn't mm -hmm. tell me how he got that. Okay. But I would think that he probably tricked him into signing something. Who knows? But. Wow. And so he calls off, you know, basically going any further on this investigation as to what, what happened at that point uh, because he just figured, you know, let the Novus Ordo have them and... Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, if it was above board, if if he wanted to be with them, then they would have let us, uh, he could have told us right to, the Archbishop Tuck could have told everybody right to our faces and been right out in the open about it. The fact that it happened behind closed doors tells us that that wasn't his will. Yeah. What about... Uh, so he abandoned him, in other words. You know? What about as far as any of the, I know the passport, uh, Bishop Vassellis told you he he took his passport, but uh, how about any other letters or calls that were coming in? Were they uh, also intercepted? You do you know anything about yeah, that? Yeah, actually, uh, as I vaguely remember, there were calls from Europe quite frequently, actually, and I don't think he ever got those calls. People wanted to talk to him, and they could never get to get him on the phone. You know, mm -hmm. every every phone call that came in would be intercepted, but you couldn't call the Archbishop directly on the, on the community phone. They just wouldn't give him the phone? No, they wouldn't give him the phone. He didn't, he didn't have a phone in his room. He was living in a little, little tiny cell. It was a disgrace that an Archbishop was living in such a quarters. They didn't care. Now, he, as you know, as far as Bishop Vassellus, has this idea that he's the only bishop in the whole world, and uh, he obviously is confused uh, of the difference between supply jurisdiction and ordinary jurisdiction, which, in normal situations, a pope is the only one that can give a mandate for a consecration of a bishop. And if it's not done with that mandate, it's an automatic excommunication. Of course, we're not in that time. But um, well, that's he, a and he obviously was not consecrated himself, Bishop Vassellus, with a, a mandate from a real pope, uh, which we can, you know, a person could understand how a person could go about doing that in an emergency situation such as we're in to give the sacraments. Right. Um, but he claims to have ordinary jurisdiction. So I think another priest was telling me that at one point in time, I don't know if it was in the 1980s, he sent out a letter to all the other so-called traditional bishops throughout the country telling them that they all need to report to him, Bishop Vassellus, for orders as to what they need to do next. And well, that's, 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 well, did you happened. hear about that? Oh, yeah, I sure did. Uh, Bishop Musey and him, uh, Bishop Musey didn't claim ordinary jurisdiction, and Vizalis sort of talked them into claiming it. And then they divided the country up oh, in half, yeah. half. And then there, there were only two at the time. So yeah, Musey had what the western part of the United States, and yeah, Vizalis is the eastern part. Yeah, they had a diocese to have the country. Yeah. And then Vizalis sent out this letter, as you just correctly stated, to, to all the priests, not to the bishops. Okay, the priests. The priest, okay. And demanded that they report to him in two weeks, or they'd be excommunicated. Well, the priests got this letter. They, what, who is this? You know, they were mystified, and I don't think any of them complied to it. Complied so he did. It, he just sent it to the priests. He didn't send it to the other bishops, also. Well, there were no other bishops at the time except music. Okay. That was it. Hmm. So. 
What about Bishop McKenna? Or that was no, later? that was several years later. Okay. Yeah. No, they're the first ones. Hmm. First ones, amazing. And what's what's ironic is that Pope Pius XII in his encyclical Mystici Corpus Christi of June 29th, 1943, in .42 of that encyclical, he points out that bishops receive ordinary jurisdiction from a pope. Well, obviously, yeah, even yeah. If, if you can justify the, well, we can justify the consecration, but you can't claim jurisdiction. Yeah. It has to come from the pope, absolutely. And so this idea of him uh, being the only bishop uh, throughout the whole world and everyone needs to report to him, um, I guess that was the mentality between his uh, of his selfish outlook, incredibly evil and self selfish outlook of allowing Bishop Tucker, thinking it might be a good idea or providential maybe even, that uh, Bishop Tuck's in the hands of the Novus Ordo Church, so no more uh, rival quote, traditional yeah. bishops are consecrated. Yeah, I wouldn't call it selfish so much as ambitious. He was just very ambitious. Wow. And I, I understand he's all the way to this day. He also, I know for a fact, because um, I know some people that actually were, were going up to his chapel may still actually go there, where he actually had certain people sign a document where they actually had to sign their names to a declaration that he was the only Catholic bishop in the whole world, and he was the only lawful, I think maybe the language might be, the only lawful Catholic bishops th throughout the whole world, and that everybody to be Catholic has to submit to him and all his lawful successors. I, we have it somewhere. I don't know the exact wording on the document, but it's actually quite incredible. Yeah, um, I've, I've the, heard that secondhand. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, I've actually we have a copy of it somewhere, but it's it's almost like a papal kind of uh, kind of thing that you have to to agree to. Uh, it's just really uh, quite amazing. Someone else was saying that he actually holds the position that you can be possessed by demons if you eat unblessed food. Have you ever heard that? No, I never heard okay. that one. Okay, someone was uh, saying I was just trying to find out about that. Wow, that's, um, yeah, so that's uh, quite a story. Now, some of the other objections, um, people have said that why did Bishop Tuck consecrate, um, for example, in Palmer de Troya, Spain, I believe it is. Uh -huh. And uh, I know that uh, Brother Joseph, the founder of our community, uh, made a visit one time out there years ago just to see what this was all about. He knew really very, very little of what was going on out there. In Palm of the Troya. Yeah, yeah. and he, he just said that you know, their, their processions, uh, the devotion seemed quite amazing. He said if you could see it from the people. Uh, but obviously, uh, I think what Bishop Tuck went down there, consecrated... Uh, this guy Clemente, I believe it was, and uh, it was it was after his consecration of him that he then came out and claimed to be Pope. That's right. Okay. Um, well, what happened is amazingly, Archbishop Clark <coughs> was in a cone with Archbishop Lefebvre um, about 1975, thereabouts, and um, a, a group of these men from Palma de Troya, who appeared to be very holy and saintly and everything, came there and said, "We're having apparitions of our." the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she's telling us what to do to, to save the church and everything, and we, she wants us to have a, a bishop consecrated, and can you, you know, comply with her wishes, you know? And so Archbishop Lefebvre, they went to Archbishop Lefebvre and told him that, so he went to Archbishop Tuck and said, listen, I can't, I don't have the time to go there, I'm running the seminary, why don't you go down there? And so he, they took, drove Archbishop Tuck down the palm of the tree. He really didn't know what he was getting himself into. Um, but at the time, he went there, and he saw a lot of piety and prayers and devotions, and, and they seemed like very holy people indeed, and they convinced him that Blessed Virgin Mary was there or something like that. And uh, he did he consecrated that man, Clemente. Well, uh, things were, uh, I still think, quite normal at that time, but uh, three or four months later, I think this happened in March, the following May, um, Clemente, the man was in an automobile accident, had a very severe head injury such that he went blind, and then he came out uh, not too long after that, uh, claiming that uh, that the, I don't know heaven or, or or Jesus Christ or someone had declared him to be the Pope. Well, about that's well, what he was claiming, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, this is you know probably I think September or something like that. And uh, Archbishop um, Tuck and a few others said, "Well, this is, I'm out of here," and they left there. They wanted nothing to do with that. And didn't he actually? He wrote a letter denouncing. His activity, I think. He renounced it. Yeah, he yeah. renounced all that activity. Uh -huh. And he only, I think, consecrated one man. I'm not sure of that, but uh, if not, that only a couple. 
And then this Clemente went crazy. He started consecrating everybody under the sun. I, think, I understand it. And that's and it gave a bad name to Archbishop Tuck. Yeah, he was it. he was like making fifteen year olds cardinals and oh, and, they were doing everything. Yeah. But Tuck didn't do that. He had no intention to do anything like that. Yeah. Was, he was just trying to do something good and that came came from Our Lady. I think I did see that. actually the letter he wrote denouncing Clemente's activity. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's an unfortunate thing that people use a smear Tuck with. And so after that, he said, "Well, enough of this." And that's when he went back to France. And didn't do anything until 1981. You know, he was just, I'm not going to get involved with this kind of stuff anymore. And when he consecrated those uh, uh, two priests uh, from, was it Mexico, was that in Germany he did that? No, it was in France. It was, it was, it was in all, France, okay. Yeah, and, and same with Deloria, it was all in France. Okay. Yeah. So that's sort of the history on um, anything else that people uh, should know about the consecrations uh, or the well, ordinations? I think what I always tell people that historically that's pretty much it, and, 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 and very briefly, of course. But uh, the tuck line is not organized. There's no organ, formal organization of the tuck bishops and priests, which is unfortunate. Uh, but what you can say about them that's very positive is that they're 100% valid. All the ceremonies, all the sacraments are done in the traditional rites with the traditional oils. Um, and they're orthodox. They're, they're well, not, not all of them. Not a, not every one of them, because there are quite a few that believe people in other religions can be saved. And well, other than that blood. controversial dogma, I, I shouldn't say controversial, but I mean, well, okay, you have a point. But and a, and also natural family planning. A lot of them believe that it's permissible to you know limit the size of the family. So those would be the two issues. Well, what I meant is they're not like the Greek Orthodox or the old Catholics, and you can't put them in that category. Well, no, I wouldn't put them in the same category as yeah. them. Yeah, no. So, yeah. Uh, but um, anyway, so that's, I don't know, I guess that's the history very, very briefly then. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going blank unless you have more yeah, questions. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, <laughs> that gives people a brief overview of, uh, <clears throat> you know, what happened to uh, Bishop Tuck. And oh, he did die in that seminary, by the way. Oh, yeah, okay, so I he... I that part of the story if you're interested. Uh, yeah, what, uh, he somehow, someone said he was down in Missouri somewhere, or what, what happened well, there? Well, I, I, I got, um, I had to take a few twists in terms of my life, but I ended up um, studying with the priesthood in Florida with a priest, and um, I still felt very badly that, uh, you know, Archbishop Tuck had been treated the way he was. I had, uh, an Archbishop should not be treated that way. No one should be, but not a prince of the church, so... I, I called the FBI, and they ended up telling me that he was in Carthage, Missouri, with a uh, Vietnamese uh, settlement, if you will, or, 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 or all the, a lot of the Vietnamese who left Vietnam in 1975 had ended up in Carthage, Missouri, where they had a Catholic community and a Catholic seminary, and they put Archbishop Tuck there, where he was probably somewhat comfortable. Well, well when you say they put them there, who, who's they? Piologi. Piologi. Okay, yeah. so basically this, this rich Vietnamese... Businessman, obviously, he was hooked up with P.O. Loggi, and together they shipped him off to uh, Missouri. Yeah, exactly, and I, I guess they, they must have pacified the archbishop or made him promises. They didn't make him promises, actually. They promised him that it would be in a nice, warm climate, and they lied to him. That was not a nice, warm climate. But anyway, they made some promises to him and uh, somehow talked him into him to going out there and, and staying with him. You know. Um, and maybe what he just thought it was a, just a place to have a room and, and somewhere to eat. I mean, he obviously wasn't going to j obviously join the Vietnamese Novus Ordo community down there. No, no, he was. Well, he lived in the seminary, but they let him say the old mass. He said the mass every day, the old mass. I was told that by the superiors there, and uh, he said the old mass to the end. They had to continued to ask him to sign documents re recanting what he had done. He never signed them. He, uh, they sent me. I, well, after he was, I think, murdered, but after that, I called the seminary, accused him of kidnapping and murder, and they said, oh, no, 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 he recanted everything, he didn't want anything to do with you people, you know. He called, they, they called us separatists, we were the separatists, they called us. And so they sent me these papers, uh, letters, uh, supposedly written by Archbishop Tuck to Roman and everything, recanting his position, renouncing the, say how sorry he was that he consecrated bishops and everything, but none of them were signed, not even a forgery, they weren't even those hmm. things at all. Um, anyway, it was amazing to me that he, uh, now he went to this, uh, let me get the time frame right, he went there at, in, uh, probably about August or so, maybe 
July or August of 1984, he had gone out there. Um, I got this information I shared with you just now about September, October of that year. He died the following December, that same December, December 84. And he, um, he shouldn't have died because I inquired about what the cause was, and they said, well, the cause was diabetes. But the point is, uh, he, he didn't have diabetes that severely. He wasn't even on, on insulin. He was only taking uh, oral pills for, for, for diabetes. And this certainly shouldn't have been a terminal thing. And, uh, and, and they waited. He didn't die until, I think it was the day after, the new Nova Soto bishop was installed in that diocese in Springfield. And then he died um, in the St. John's Hospital there. They wouldn't they give me too much information because I wasn't a relative. Hmm. But it just seemed the timing and the reason they gave for the death led me to believe that that, that really was foul play. Um, in fact, I'll tell you, share a little story with you. At one point in this process of trying to get the Archbishop um, out of this country back to France, I contacted the immigration uh, uh, department and told them that we have a French citizen here that, that's um, um, here illegally because his, his visa's run out, and, he, and you ought to send him back to home, you know. And uh, it's been, what, a year and a half or so. He only had a six-month visa, as I understand it. And they said, oh, we'll take care of this. Who is it? You know, and I gave him the name and everything. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll get back to you and let you know what, what we're going to do. And they never called me back. So I called them back. And you know what? They denied ever having talked to me. They denied that he ever, they had any record of him ever entering the country. Now, if you ever flew, if you ever went overseas, when you come back to America, you have to sign a card stating your, your country and your purpose of why you're here and why, how long you're going to be here. And that card goes to the Department of Immigration. <laughs> And they keep a computer record of you and make sure that you go back when you're supposed to and everything. At least they did that before all you know, the people from Mexico came here. But that's the way it was then in 1983-84. Well, they had no record at all that he ever entered this country. This is after they sent him a passport, mind you, okay? Mm. Wow. So somebody up pretty high up had gotten to, the, uh, to somebody else in this sort of... Uh, Clamp the whole thing down. And so, what was actually Bishop Vassellis' reaction once uh, he heard maybe, I don't know if anyone informed him he was d uh, down in Missouri? I have no idea. I've any contact. Basically, I guess what, after that one time when he seemed to fall into the Novus Ordo Church's hands when you were there, I guess he basically just felt maybe it was better at that point in time and just left it at that? Isn't oh, yeah, it? he didn't care. He didn't watch it at all. He so didn't he, didn't, he didn't, after that point, he didn't even try to investigate it any further? No. Why would he? As far as I know, he never did. I don't know. I never yeah. had any more contact with him after that. I left the community yeah. shortly after that. Hmm. Wow. When he wasn't there. Wow. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's all very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, coming on, uh, Father Webster, and sharing with us all those uh, details about uh, Bishop Tuck. Okay, I enjoyed it very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bye-bye okay. now.